going to start off with a great song this morning. And uh, I know on this uh, new disc music, it says, Echo Key Fly. <laughs> and, and it does in this song, so you're going to really enjoy it. Morning. Good morning. I can thank you all for being here this morning. So good to see you here this morning. And it's a good day to be an Arkansan. <laughs> Whether you support the Tide, the Vols, or the Hogs, we won. And so that's, that's good to see. But even better, uh, the, even a greater reason to be happy this morning is because we're heaven bound. Because we are going to the kingdom if we know Jesus as Savior. And it's our prayer this morning that if you don't know Jesus as Lord, that you come to that knowledge before you leave here today. We're going to just, uh, continue our singing here in just a moment, but before we do, let's look to God in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you so much for the day that you've given us, and thank you for the ability to come to your house this morning, Lord. And Father, I pray that everything we do here can be honoring and glorifying unto you. Father, we pray that we sing with our hearts, that we sing uh, praises unto your name. We pray that we, as we open your word, Lord, that you would 
speak to us and convict us where we need to be convicted. Father, we pray that we can be the church that you need us to be in this community. We pray also for our sister churches in this area as well, Lord, as they try to to spread uh, your gospel and to promote your kingdom as well, Lord. Lord, forgive us where we fail you and forgive us of our sins and all of our shortcomings. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sister Kristen. sang their hearts out. I got one here this morning. Brady, I'm so glad you're here. Well, I'm so glad to have good new kids. It's wonderful to have new kids, new little parents. It's just wonderful. And they did such a good job. <laughs>
This morning, I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 6. I want to ask you a question. Do legal things interest you? Not like if you have to go to court, that's not interesting, but do legal um, books, shows, that nature interest you? Me, I, I, the answer would be yes. Um, one of my favorite authors is John Grisham, who takes these little thrilling books, and there's a little legal twist to them. Uh, you probably know The Firm and The Broker and his books and movies. Um, I really enjoyed them. And I remember um, also watching Judge Judy. Anybody watch Judge Judy? <laughs> kind of a, a bit of, a, a, an, of an annoyance rather than a legal show. Um, I, I looked up most ridiculous Judge Judy shows, and I found one, and it was a friend, a lady, who was suing her ex-friend for sitting and breaking her toilet. So there's that one. And so that's interesting. But in, <laughs> but in college, I had a business law teacher. And so we'd go into her class, and we had this boring law textbook. But she would take that textbook, and she would reword it, and she would put it into things that we could understand and we could uh, grasp and comprehend. And so when you left that classroom that day, that Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you would leave thinking that you could be a lawyer. And several times I did. I was like, I can go to law school, but then there's a problem, law school. And so that would be the issue blocking that endeavor. But it's always really been interesting to me. But who do we sue? Who do we go to court with? Who, who, who are we allowed to go to court with and to bring lawsuits against? Tuesday I was at the church and I had a notification on Twitter. came over and it said that Lifeway ha was suing its previous CEO. And if you understand, Lifeway is the Southern Baptist Convention's publishing arm. You remember these Lifeway Christian stores? That's them. And so that, that's their publishing. We have Bogard Press for ABA churches. Well, that's their Bogard Press. It's Lifeway. That's their publishers, and that's who they use. So they were going to sue their previous CEO for breach of contract. He retired, and he's still on staff serving in some capacity. But he signed and said basically he won't publish with another um, publisher, and he, he did. He, he agreed. They had talks. He thought it was okay, so he went ahead with the signing hadn't done anything, uh, to my understanding, anything more than that. But they brought a lawsuit against him. Well, Wednesday, I had another notification saying they were going to seek, uh, really, not, they weren't going to go the legal route. They were going to settle out of court. Friday, I got a notification saying they were going to go back on their going back, and now they're going to court again. But the first thought I had Tuesday is if you know what Lifeway is, is and what they stand for, who they are, and if you know Dr. Rayner, Dr. Tom Rayner, what he does is he helps ministers and churches and pastors. Uh, he's been really good at talking with some of the pastors and churches going through the pandemic and helping them. And so understanding that he's in ministry and that they are in ministry, how does that look that they're suing each other? To me, the first thing I, I saw, I said, that looks terrible. That, that hurts the Southern Baptist Convention, and it hurts Baptists in general because the world doesn't necessarily understand the difference between us. And, but that hurts because you have these two ministries, these two endeavors going to court for each other. So how do we go to court with our brothers and sisters in Christ? What do we do when the person who you filed a lawsuit against the person on the other end of that lawsuit is someone who you've shared a pew with or you've shared a Sunday school classroom with? Well, that's exactly what we're going to talk about in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And so the first thing I want to bring up is the matter that we see in verse 1 and verse 6. Paul writes, he says, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Verse 6. But brother goeth to law with the brother, and that before the unbelievers. So really there's, there's some mistakes within these two verses that Paul's getting to. And the first thing is, in verse 1, he starts this chapter off by saying, How dare you? I wish I could to stress to you the, the importance of this little phrase, how powerful it is. He says, how dare you do this? If you can do anything else, don't do this. He says, dare any of you having a matter against another. So first off, there's some kind of problem that's arisen between two church members. And we talked about in the past couple uh, of weeks, what do we do when there's matters between church members? If a brother offends you, go to him. Step number two would be take some more people. Step number three would be bring it before the church 
step four would be exclusion in hopes that we regain a brother. That's how church discipline says. But he says, there's been a matter that arises between you. And so number problem number one, he says, verse one, he says, you go to law before the unjust. He says, so the, the main problem is you have this matter and you're not handling it the biblical way. You're taking each other to court. You're taking each other to the courtroom trying to settle your differences. Here's the problem with that in verse one. He says, why are you not going before the saints? How good does it look if people know that we represent West Box Out Baptist Church? How good does it look if I begin to sue all of my deacons? If I begin to sue all of my Sunday school teachers? If I begin to sue every single member that steps through the door? How would that look? On me, it would look terrible. On the church, it would look awful. And so we first need to understand is that we bear the name of the church. We represent the name of the church. Adults, as you go, as you go to work, you carry the name of the church with you. You bear that testimony. Kids, when you go to school or when you go home, you represent this church. You, you represent the local New Testament body that you're a member of. And so the, the Corinthians had misunderstood that they had forgotten that. And so these matters had arisen and they didn't handle them biblically. Rather, they said, we're going to get somewhere. We're going to take you to court. And the problem with that is they're going before these unjust judges. Not in that they're not fair, not, they're not, uh, not that they're not unbiased, but that they're not saved. They don't know the ways of the scripture. They don't know what the Bible says. And so you're taking these matters that should be handled with, within the church outside of the church walls. He said, that's a problem. Because we're supposed to have this testimony about ourselves to be different. And the church is supposed to, uh, to really embody this idea of unity and maturity and uh, in one accordness. If that's even a, a, a phrase, we'll use it as, if, uh, as, it if, as if it is one. But that's really what the church should be about is unity, getting along, loving each other, even if we don't agree. And so when we take matter where we can't agree on something before the judge... And the unbelievers look at that, and there's the problem. Because this church that's supposed to live by the Bible and supposed to do everything in accordance to God's word can't get along. It looks bad before the unbelievers. And so Paul says, why are you not going before the saints? Look in verse 2. He says, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life. So Paul says, he, he alludes that we're going to reign. And so he, he says that we're going to reign first off the world, or judge the world. The second thing he says we're going to judge are the angels. I wish Paul would have added a little bit to this so we could explain it a little bit. But regardless, that's not the point of why he says it. He says, look, we're going to, after all this is over with, we're going to hold this position of authority we're going to reign and we're going to judge the world and the angels. He says, so in light of that fact that we're going to reign and we're going to judge, he says in verse 2, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Since such a large endeavor is going to be given to you, are you not unworthy right now to judge what's happening within your walls? Can the church not handle what's going on between the members? Can the church not take care of the problems, that are, uh, the, the problems that are arising? He says, because when you think about it, in light of everything that's going on, these matters that really get in, uh, get in between us, divide us, they're pretty small. And so Paul says, why can't you get along? Why can't you, pr you bring it to the church? Why is the church unworthy to not be able to judge the smallest matters if such a large role is going to be given to them later on? And so in verse 3, he says, how much more things that pertain to this life? And so he tells them what to do in verse 4. He says, if then you have judge, uh, judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. He says, so if you do have lawsuits and, and matters come up in the church, he says, and here's what you should do. Set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. Have you ever seen kids... There's two kids, and they're fighting, and they bring in a third kid to try to be the mediator. They're like, here's my story. Here, here's their story. Now, which one of us is right? And the kids are like, I don't know. I'm nine. I don't know. That's kind of the idea here is, is if there are problems in the church, then you need to call someone. You need to appoint someone 
who is going to be able to decide against it. It doesn't need to leave the church. And so what he says is appoint someone who is least esteemed in the church. Now, the idea of the least esteemed is kind of this idea of unbiased. If you're called to, ju to jury duty, you can't serve on a jury in which you know the, par the plaintiff or the defendant. Why? Because it's not really fair. It's kind of biased. If I know that I really, maybe I, I've shared a dorm room or I shared a neighborhood with this person, I want to sh make sure that they go free, even if there is a little bit of guilt there. Because I like them, because we have that emotional, uh, emotional attachment. So they'll dismiss you as a juror to keep the jury fair. And so the idea behind this least esteemed person in the church is he's not really going to be biased. He's not really going to care one way or another. He's not going to lean to the right or to the left. He's going to be able to make the correct decision. So set someone who is able to decide for this purpose. Handle it within the church. So verse 5, he continues. He says, I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. So verse 5, he, he, he begins to speak. He says, I speak to your shame. He said, you should be ashamed of this because you are boasting of your wisdom. You're boasting of being smart. You're boasting of being able to handle all these things. But yet when matters arise, you're not wise enough to handle them. He said, you should be ashamed of this problem. He said, is it not so that there is not a wise man among you? In all your worldly wisdom, is there not someone who can handle this lawsuit? Is there not someone who can handle this matter within your church? So he continues. He says, no, not one that should be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now here's the, here's the uh, big problem, verse 7. He says, now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? So here's kind of the idea of how the Christian should deal with a lawsuit, if one was to come. I think the first question we should ask is when lawsuits arise in the church is why are you, first off, pressing a lawsuit? Well, it's because let's, let's take a service, for example. He didn't perform the service as needed. Well, then the question would become why did you not perform the service as needed? Right, we should have never gotten to the point where a lawsuit was needed or a matter should have arisen. If we're living a Christian life in such a way, then we're not robbing anyone of services that we're rendering to them. If we are living such a uh, biblical life, then we're not going to rob and to defraud each other on purpose. We're going to begin by doing the job right. And secondly, if there is a problem, then we would then take it up with the person who did it. And so this should never happen. He says, but it is happening because you're warring in the church. He says, because you go to law one with another. So verse 7, here's two questions. He says, why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Have you ever met people who said, I'm not going to be taken advantage of? I'm not going to be robbed. I'm not going to pay an extra penny if I don't have to. I'm not going to be taken. It's kind of the wrong attitude to have. Paul says, why would you not rather yourselves be robbed or be defrauded or be taken advantage of? He says, why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Let's take Lifeway and, and Dr. Rayner, for example. Why would Lifeway not, for a moment, be defrauded? Why would they not be wrong? Instead, because of what happened, let's like my first initial uh, response is kind of, this is ridiculous, that looks terrible on the two ministries. That's really the idea about why one party should be wrong. It's so that the world doesn't, ha the, the, doesn't see this problem in the church and say, wow, that's a terrible issue to have. It's in order to keep the testimony of the local New Testament church. It's in order to keep the unity and to keep the peace within the church. There was a story told by uh, Leonard Sweet. Uh, a, man, a minister named Tom Wiles picked him up at the airport in a brand new truck back in 2002. So he picked him up. He took him to a leadership conference. And a couple days later, he picked him back up to take him back to the airport. And when, he, when Leonard was getting into Tom's truck, he saw that there was dings and scratches and some dents in the truck. He said, Tom, what'd you do to your new truck? He said, the, uh, the neighbor's basketball goal fell on it. He said, oh, that's terrible. I can smell the new car smell still. 
He said, what's even worse is that the neighbor doesn't find anything wrong. He's, he doesn't think that he did anything wrong. And so he said, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to get insurance involved? Or what are you going to do? He said, well, I've kind of had that spiritual problem myself. He said, me and my wife have talked about getting an attorney. He said, but the problem is I'm going to more, most likely have that neighbor a whole lot longer than I'm going to have that truck. And so at the very ending of the story, he basically says that it's worth having a few dents and dings in your truck to keep the peace between your neighbor. Instead of taking your neighbor to court, getting a few dents and dings out of your truck, because that truck will be traded here 10, 12 years. It'll fall apart and you'll get rid of it. But the relationship you have with your neighbor is a little bit more important than the vehicle. And so the idea is that Tom's going to be defrauded. He's going to be robbed because he, the neighbor is at fault. But in order to keep the harmony between the neighbors, he was going to be defrauded. That's the idea. He says, why are you not allowing yourself to be defrauded? Why are you not suffering that you maybe get the short end of the stick out of, out of the deal? He says in verse 8, nay, you do wrong and defraud and that to your brother. He says, instead, you're going to make sure that you're not wrong. And in doing so, you are wrong because you're going to, to the courtroom. Now, I've never met a, a lawyer who walks into the courtroom wanting to lose. Right? If you go to court, typically you want to win. You want to get as much money as you can. You want to get right. And so the problem when two Christian brothers go to the courtroom, one of them is going to have to lose. And so they're going and doing, uh, they're going to court and they're defrauding their own brother. So it's a major problem in the church because they're wronging each other, they're defrauding each other. And so Paul brings in a very interesting next three verses. He says in verse 9, Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. So Paul calls this to their attention. He says there's a standard for the kingdom of God. There's a standard for admittance. He says you can't be a fornicator, you can't be an adulterer, you can't be an idolater. You can't have this sin in your life. If you're going to enter into the kingdom of God and inherit the kingdom of God and to spend an eternity in the Lord's kingdom, there can't be any sin among you. Okay. Verse 11. And such were some of you. Paul says, look, there's a standard for the Lord. And that standard is perfection. If you want to live in the kingdom of of God and to dwell in eternity with the Lord, then there can't be any sin in your life. But there was. Some of the Corinthian church members were fornicators. Some were idolaters. Some were adulterers. Some were abusers. Some were thieves. Some were coveters. Some were drunkards. Some were revilers. Paul says, such were some of you. And such were some of us. He says, but first off in verse 11, you're washed, but you're sanctified, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. He says, you were a sinful people, but you were washed. You were sanctified, and you were justified. And so in light of what God has forgiven you of, because he had a standard, we've fallen short, Nevertheless, he washed us, he sanctified us, he justified us. And so in light of what God's forgiven us of, look among your brethren. And if your brethren has done something wrong against you, forgive them as well. Because what the world's trying to do is to take and to get and to earn and to accumulate. Psalm 49 talks about this. He says, we can't take any of it to the grave. And I'm paraphrasing, of course, that's not the King James translation of that. But we can't take anything we accumulate here on earth to the grave. Instead, we can use it to bless each other while we're here. And so the, the point of Paul's whole judgment on this and, and statements on the judgment is that what we have, we can use to bless others. 
it's not about accumulating as much as you can. It's not about earning as much as you can or trying to get ahead in life. It's all about being a blessing to others. Therefore, showing to others the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It's not about defrauding the church members or to, to take them to court. It's all about joining together so that we can spread the gospel. Because outside of our walls, these four walls that we're inside right now, there's a list of people out there that are listed in verse 9 and verse 10. There are thieves, there are adulterers, there are idolaters. In order for us to impact them, we may have to suffer some defrauding. We may have to be robbed a couple of times in order to evangelize them. So Paul says, in light of what Jesus has done for you, in light of all that he's forgiven you of, take a moment and think what all he's forgiven you of. Paul's very good at his list in verses 9 and 10. If I was to list all my sins, I'd need a whole lot more than two verses. I see a lot of head shaking, so you can too. And so in light of what God has forgiven us of, in turn, let's forgive our brothers so that we can appeal to those who are still dead in their sin. And so in light of what God's forgiven you, can you forgive those that do you wrong? And then in light of, in verse 3, how we're going to be judges of the world and judges of the angels, then today we should live a life that is able to judge them in the future. Meaning that since we're going to be given the authority and this ability to sit in such a high capacity, then today we should live a life worthy of that authority, of that position. Because the Corinthians in, verse, in chapter 3, remember, he said he wanted to talk to them, but they were too immature. He wanted to speak to them maturity, but he couldn't because they wouldn't understand it. And so they were living this lifestyle. They weren't ready to judge the angels in the world because they were still caught up on defrauding each other. And so in light of that, in light of what we're going to do with Jesus and when you get to Revelation, then the, the way we live our lives today also matters. It matters in that we are living in such a way that we are going to be able to judge the angels and judge the world. And so this morning I want to close and ask you a few questions. First off, is there something that your brother has done against you that you haven't forgiven him of? Instead of making matters worse, instead of accumulating to the problem, first off, take it to him. And if nothing happens, then forgive them for the sake of the church. Secondly, are you living your life worthy of the ability and the capacity we're going to serve in later? And thirdly, if you see your sin listed in verse 9, verse 10, and even if you don't, Are you sure Jesus is your Savior? Because we can live these lifestyles of sin, listen to verse 9 and 10, we can live these lifestyles, or you can be washed, you can be sanctified, and you can be justified. But in order for that to happen, you have to leave verses 9, verses 10, you have to leave that sinful life behind you. You have to turn and say, I'm done living that way, I'm done living that lifestyle, and I want to be washed. I want to be sanctified. I want to be justified. And the way you do that is you just repent of that sin and you ask him to forgive you. There's a lot of us in here today that will tell you that he's forgiven me a whole lot, uh, a whole lot more than the things he'll have to forgive you of. And so because he's forgiven me, he is able to forgive you. And so this morning, regardless of the sin that you've committed or regardless of the lifestyle you've been living, Jesus Christ can save you. He will forgive you because he forgave me. And I believe it's the will of this church that you don't leave here understanding that you're living a lifestyle of sin, trying to get ahead, and it's never going to be enough. There's always going to be something in your heart, something in your lifestyle that is seeking after something that's missing. The thing missing is Jesus. The thing missing is the Holy Spirit. Because we were made, we we're a people of relationships. There's a reason we want friends, we want spouses, we want children and grandchildren. It's because we are a people destined for relationships. And the greatest relationship you can have is with that of your Heavenly Father. This morning, don't leave, don't return to your sinful lifestyle. Rather, stop where you are. Turn and come to Jesus. Ask Him to forgive you, and I promise He will.
and ask him to be your savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your grace, Lord. Father, we thank you that we were dead in our sin and we were trapped in our trespasses, Lord, but you made a way when there was no way. You gave us a Savior when we were not worthy. So, Father, we're thankful that while we were yet sinners, while we were dead in sin, Lord, you saved us. You made a way on the cross to take away our sin and to take our trespasses away, Lord. Now there's a way that you can forgive us. And so, Father, we pray, Lord, that if we have lived these lives of sinfulness, Lord, that you can forgive us and that we ask for your forgiveness. But, Father, we pray for those who have never placed their faith in you, Lord. We pray for those who, deep down in their hearts, Lord, still know that they're living a lifestyle of sin, who understand, Lord, that they're trapped in their sinfulness and they're, there's no way out, there's no hope aside from the hope that is found in you. And so, Father, we pray that during this invitation that those who know their need of a Savior, who understand that they're lost and they're destined for hell, Lord, we pray that they would come to know you before it's everlasting too late. Father, we pray that they wouldn't leave here without knowing your Son as Savior. Lord, be with us and convict us where we're wrong. Convict us where we need convicting, Lord, and allow us to get right with you. Be with this invitation, Lord, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand, please?